Welcome to the Consummate Athlete Podcast, where we explore what it means to be a well-rounded, happy, goal-crushing athlete. Every week, myself, sports journalist Molly Herford, and cycling coach and kinesiologist Peter Glassford interview experts and chat through all of your training questions. We're excited to have you along for the ride. Hello, hello. Welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. Peter, how's it going? It's going well. Yeah, we've been having rolling along here. Summer is here, it seems like, so that's good. We, the risk of winter is less. Definitely, yes. I'm not expecting snowstorms, although the constant uh, threat of rain is, is okay. a little bit annoying. Well, there you go. That's the weather update. Yep. Yep. No snow, threat of rain. Uh, anyway, uh, this week on the podcast, we have my friend Lindsay Cortez. She is a sports dietitian, RD, uh, host of the Female Athlete Nutrition Podcast. And I was actually on her podcast back in February. So we'll link to that episode in the show notes. Uh, and we were talking about really sports nutrition for young girls and teens and sort of what's what's missing uh kind of along the the chain right like i feel like there's kind of kid nutrition which is uh, kid sports nutrition which is just eat snacks drink water and then there's adult sports nutrition but we kind of miss talking about that teen the teen years right uh, which can be very very tricky as i've learned as i've talked to more and more teen athletes so if you want to hear more about that definitely check out that episode i did with her but uh, what we talked about for this episode was a lot of stuff around REDS and Low Energy Availability, LEA, uh, which is another acronym that's been popping up a lot lately. I don't know if you've noticed that, but no. it seems to be a little bit. I think it's because REDS, so Relative Energy Deficiency in Sport, uh, is a very big deal. Like It's a pretty critical situation, whereas LEA is kind of that precursor to it, so you're not quite in... Right. I guess maybe you could go into low energy availability yeah. on a given day, and then maybe the the syndrome or is, is you know long term. Yeah, it's not quite as uh, I don't know terrifying in some ways too. So I think it is like a bit easier to talk about, a bit easier to you know hopefully catch early uh, rather than getting all the way into red S territory. So that's a lot of what we're talking about today. And, you know, I'll just add before anyone who's listening to this that thinks that, oh, this isn't for me, this isn't about me, uh, no, red S can absolutely happen to anyone. I mean... At any body size, too. That's sort of the tricky thing. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So this is definitely a super important episode for everybody who listens to the show. So don't uh, don't count yourself out of the red ass discussion if you're, you know, a, a master's man who, you know, maybe is over that like 200 pound threshold that we often hear from. Uh, that you could very easily still be in that relative energy mm -hmm. deficiency. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and that relates to sports performance. It relates to health. Um, you know, the Masters man example. You know, the the Masters men. You know, I always joke that you know, oh, you know, it's not like everything is for them already. But uh, often that often turns them uh, away from paying attention to things like this, right? And it is that that group that's trying to you know stave off mid uh, middle age weight gain or something like that. But then they're also finding their performance and their power is coming down. Maybe you know issues around testosterone or libido or these types of things uh, that can be related to that. And then the tricky thing with all this is you could be cutting all these, you know, having the low energy availability, but then also seeing a, a weight gain as the metabolism sort of, you know, shuts down and hormonal dysregulation. Which is just so painfully ironic and upsetting. <laughs> right, right. For everyone involved, uh, or, you know, it could happen to anyone, but this is sort of the messy thing to untangle and that where an RD uh, could certainly be of good use as you're trying to, you know, work through that versus going down, you know, another fad diet or restricting even harder or, or, or whatever. Yeah. And I mean, you've even really found a lot of this. In... Oh, it's wild. Yeah. This fueling stuff is just great. Yeah. As it turns <laughs> out, fueling I mean, yeah, appropriately. Yeah. Just, just recently, you know, we did this big bike packing and I had great energy through it throughout the day and a lot of it was coming to terms with you know there's a bunch of sugar powder that you know is coming in mm -hmm. yeah exactly all right well before we start talking too much about this let's get into this episode with Lindsay. definitely check out again the female athlete nutrition podcast she has a ton of resources also over at riseupnutrition.com to make sure you check out all of those after the episode enjoy all right Lindsay, welcome to the consummate athlete podcast i am so excited to have you Thank you, Molly. I was like thrilled to connect with you a couple months ago and have you on my podcast, which was amazing and super excited to 
be here and do this for you. And I know we're going to have a great conversation. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's start with just kind of giving everyone a bit of your, your bio. I mean, you know, we have the female athlete nutrition podcast, but also let's talk about like, give us a quick rundown of your history in sport, how you got into, you know, being a dietitian, all the things. (laughs) Yeah, sure. Sure. So yeah, I mean, just as a, as a kid, I was an athlete. I feel like I did all the sports, basketball, soccer, skiing, gymnastics was my main sport and then track and field as well. Um, and it was funny when I was looking into like college and what I wanted to study, I was looking into like sports program, kinesiology, uh, physical therapy, and like nothing was really like, like, cause sports was kind of like what I was interested in. And yet to study it didn't interest me. And it was my mother who pointed out to me like, Hey, you're pretty good with like your diet as it related to like what I ate before a gymnastics meet Mm -hmm. and like just kind of being a little particular, which we can get into the good and bad of that later on. (laughs) Um, But like my mom was the one who noticed that I cared about fueling and putting food in my body as it pertained to my sport. And so I was like, okay, I'll try that and studied it in college and and never looked back. And I will say as I studied it in college, there's many different uh, routes that you can go with nutrition, medical nutrition, um, weight loss, nutrition, like, which is like a huge part of nutrition. But I was also on the track and field team at UMass Amherst at Division Wood a division one program. I was a non-scholarship athlete, but I was still there doing it. And as I was studying nutrition and being an athlete and putting in, you know, four hours a day of training, I I really loved how it worked together, how I could use nutrition to take care of my body, fuel my body and lead to better performance. Um, I'm, I'm still young, but years ago, sports nutrition was not as much of a field as it is now. So like, I got, yeah, it's, it's, it's grown. It's still not as big as people think it is when it comes mm-hmm. to actual like jobs and full-time positions available. But, um, with that being said, I graduated UMass in 2011 and like, frankly, all my professors at the time were like, eh, you probably can't do sports nutrition. Like there's really no jobs in that, but I landed a spot at a master's program at Florida state getting my master's degree in sports nutrition and becoming a dietitian. I got to do internship rotations with um, elite and professional athletes. And yes, my first job was clinical nutrition, but from there I was able to carve my way into sports. I worked at the University of Georgia with their athletic programs, sports nutrition department. I worked at Florida State University with their athletes. And then I went on um, a little sidestep. Um, I went on to work with the U.S. Air Force Special Operations, Um, so not a traditional sport, but still helping their warfighters take care of their bodies for optimal performance. And um, then when I I left that position and started doing my own thing and picking up contracting jobs, so I contracted with the military, I contracted, I moved to Texas, the University of Texas, San Antonio, their athletes, Um, and then I started my own online business. called rise up nutrition side story there might be changing the business name but whatever (laughs) um um, but i know that feeling i know that feeling so well yeah i'm like people listening to this podcast years from now i don't know but anyways uh, my own business specializing in helping female athletes uh fuel their bodies to their highest level of performance and to be even more specific i really niche down in helping athletes overcome disordered eating because throughout all those different experiences working at the collegiate level with professional athletes um working you know with contracting gigs even working with the air force my favorite clients that i worked with was helping them you know when they were in a in a not so good spot with food, actually, maybe even as an athlete, maybe under fueling or uh, having a disordered relationship with food or too strict about their diet, which we see a lot with athletes. It's like they, they want that perfect optimal performance diet, but because of that, it's actually hurting them because they're too strict with it. Mm. And so my favorite clients to work with were those that I could help them overcome these disordered eating habits in order to truly fuel their bodies. And so that's what my business um, that I established in 2018. So we're going on six years, five, six years now 
of really specializing in that. And I did niche down to women because after working with Air Force Special Operations, I I had my fill of the men. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> Back to my roots as a female. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Oh, it's funny. We actually just missed each other in the Amherst area because I lived in East Hampton in 2012. So oh. just like a click away from you there. Wow, That's so we funny. We just missed each other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Beautiful area. Oh my gosh. Just the best. Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, I love it. So I love that it was really just like a casual thing from your mom that kind of kicked you down this whole road. Yeah. Isn't that so funny where it's like that one, like probably just like one casual conversation and completely life-changing, game-changing, just like yeah. so cool how that comes about. And- and I think too, like I, as a mother myself now, though, my boys are very young, but I just like, I'm like, oh yeah, that's mother's intuition. You know, she mm-hmm. just knew she could point yep. out to me, like, you got to do this. And I'm yeah. glad I listened. Yeah. yeah. Um, and okay. So the disordered eating in female athletes, uh, you know, your site on the front page, one of the stats you put is up to 45% of female athletes engage in some form of disordered eating. I mean, holy crap. So yeah. And I think a big part of that, probably to what you were just saying, is that it's it's not necessarily intentional. Like some of the time, absolutely. But I think a lot of the time it is worth, we're assuming we're doing the right thing uh, because, you know, we read an article or we, you know, saw a a TikTok at this point. I don't know. Um, Mm -hmm. How are we getting our information? Um, And I mean, yeah, when I was younger, there was, I think one, there was that one book on sports nutrition and I wish I could remember the author. Uh, Nancy something maybe Nancy uh, Clark yes Nancy Clark. that's it yes. that was the sports nutrition book that was the sports nutrition book that Just- was the sport and she was the sports dietitian which is yeah. why all my mentors were saying no 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 Nancy does that nobody else does that <laughs> yeah it was just so funny now because you're like wait sport like that was it it was just this is yeah. the one book it didn't matter what sport you were doing like all sports, mar- yeah. marathon soccer swimming this yep. is the book this has all your answers uh which is hilarious yes <laughs> um, so yeah. i mean let's talk yeah like why how how like how does it happen that so many of us end up in these bad eating patterns or yeah. dangerous eating patterns yeah so i i'd like to start just differentiating there is a difference between an eating disorder and disordered eating mm-hmm. Um, though there's also a lot of overlap and I do believe that somebody who has disordered eating might develop into an eating disorder and same way, sometimes we want somebody with an eating disorder to shift kind of, you know, in a sense, almost downgrade to disordered eating and then we improve from there. Right. Um, either, either situation is not ideal. It's not normalized eating. Um, and this is also difficult. There's, there's not a way to, to define normal eating because, you know, if you don't like potatoes, like that's fine. You don't have to eat, ever eat potatoes in your life. Like we all have individual preferences. We all have different needs. Um, so it's just like, there's no one way to define normal eating. Mm-hmm. However, um, when it comes to an eating disorder, that is a clinically diagnosed, we have bulimia, we have anorexia. Um, though it gets a little more confusing than that. We have eating disorders, not otherwise specified. We have binge eating, night binging, um, eat dis- eating disorder. So there's a variety. Um, and there, there are some kind of clinical markers to, um, to analyze if it is an eating disorder. And I, I'll also say eating disorders can happen for a thousand different reasons and sometimes no reason at all. However, um, it is when there's clinical manifestation in, whether it be your, your, your health, your lab work, um, you know, something like bulimia, we can have electrolyte imbalances. Um, the same thing with anorexia, we have severe malnutrition, regardless of body weight, just malnourishment. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas disordered eating, you may or may not have some of those clinical manifestations. Disordered eating might be like, okay, my blood work is good. My, uh, body is performing well. But mentally, I'm constantly obsessed with food. I have a a list of eat this, not that. It's very restrictive. It interferes with my social life. Um, you know, I I can't I can't I don't feel comfortable traveling, getting on a plane because I don't feel comfortable with airport food. That causes anxiety and stress in my life. Um, so it's disordered eating is when your behaviors, thoughts, and actions around food make life difficult. Frankly, 
Which is so sad because as you're saying that, all I can think of is how many articles exist that are like top 10 ways to like get through the airport without gaining weight or like, yeah, right? Like what you're yes. saying is essentially just you've bought into diet culture almost, which yeah. is so sad. Like you've internalized all of these diet culture, like buzz clicky articles and yeah. that's how your brain functions now. Absolutely. And, and, um, and that's why it, when we say up to 45% of female athletes engage in some form of disordered eating, now that makes sense. Oh, that's really easy to do. Frankly, it's not healthy to do. It's not right to do, but it is quite easy to do because our culture and society, um, praises and glorifies and promotes a lot of disordered behaviors around food. We mm -hmm. live in a society that's constantly promoting to eat less, exercise more. That is for the most part, the opposite of what most athletes need to do. <laughs> they're already exercising a ton. They need to rest more. And they're already, as an athlete, they're already in tune, usually, not for everybody, but they're usually already in tune with health on some level. They actually need to eat more to fuel their performance, not eat less. Mm -hmm. We are living in a culture that is obsessed with the idea of weight loss. And as a dietitian that has worked in different um, realms, I understand the need to educate some people like, okay, we shouldn't be having Coke and Cheetos every single day. For breakfast. I, yes. For breakfast. You like, I understand the need for some basic education of like health concepts, but when you take that into, um, an athlete, not every athlete is the same. So some of this is generalizing, but somebody who is determined, driven, willing to do anything, somebody who's coachable, you know, coach tells you to run, you know, 10 by 400s at this pace, you're going to freaking do it. So if somebody tells you don't eat Cheetos, now they're like, I'm never going to eat Cheetos. And they take it to the extreme. Mm -hmm. So many athletes are extreme. That's how they find success in their sport. But that extreme uh, mentality can hurt them when it comes to food. We need to loosen it up a little bit. We need to have a slice of cake. We need to have Cheetos every once in a while. Mm -hmm. um, and and so I'm going on a bit of a tangent here, but there is a lot of overlap between diet culture, disordered eating and eating disorders. Um, so it can be kind of difficult to differentiate the two. And I also, you know, I mentioned eating disorders have clinical manifestations. I mean, disordered eating can eventually get to that as well. Um, and we think about it, especially in the realm of sports, you so often have an athlete that is the quote picture of health on paper. Um, but it's like, Ooh, but I'm not recovering, but I've got these repeat injuries. And that, that is a physical manifestation of improper nutrition. Oh, why is my iron always low? Why do I always have to take an iron supplement? How come I've had three injuries in the past year? And I just feel like I'm never recovering. How come I can crush my workout, but I don't have enough energy to stand up and make myself a meal, you know, later in the day, like that fatigue, that lethargy, like those are physical manifestations of disordered eating as well. And we see that, you know, that's my biggest thing with athletes is like, this is hurting your performance. This is hurting your health. Mm -hmm. Um, even if it's not quite as obvious as, you know, somebody with, um, bulimia and, and things like that might not be, might not be as obvious. And, um, with that being said, there are plenty of athletes that also struggle with clinically diagnosed eating disorders as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, again, some people, uh, unfortunately get stuck in the cycle of like, this is maybe why, like I have to control my food in order to perform well. Um, and going on a bit of a rabbit hole here, but there's no. so much overlap. <laughs> yeah, I think this is this is such an important thing. And it's something I've talked to a lot of people about. I think the other problem too is a lot of the times there are a lot of these athletes that have had their best performances, yes. unfortunately, whilst in the middle of having an eating disorder. And then later they yeah. talk about it and that's great. But the problem is the the unfortunate message is like they won the races while they were yeah. dealing with the eating disorder. And And what I'd like to say to that is, 
they would have won the races had they not been dealing yes. with eating. So they might have even done better than that, you know, but but we just don't have that proof because you know, life life takes its course, but we want to be real careful not to draw an association um between just because two events happened at the same time does is not a direct correlation. Um and what I really love to see, um, it's difficult just because life goes on, goals change and all that. But I love to see when an athlete does um, recover, get healthier, and is actually better and stronger on the other side. We do have many, many mm-hmm. examples of that. Um, but you can also understand, that, oh, like I struggled with the eating disorder when I was a college athlete. And then after college, like I, I just like decided not to continue sport anymore and mm-hmm. that's okay. But so their brain is still associating. I was my best, Yep. you know, during that. Um, but like I said, it, it's, that's not necessarily the truth. It's correlation mm-hmm. is not causation. Yep. Um, so yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, the other, the other thing I wanted to quickly like click on is I think what's maybe difficult about disordered eating, and maybe you can speak to this is the eating disorder. You're right. Is clinical, which means it's often a lot easier to actually, like if you have health insurance and stuff, get yeah diagnosis, get help disordered eating, I think is not to say that it's easier or like harder or easier, but I think it is like more insidious because you're often out of pocket to cover help with disordered eating, at least at first. Um, 100%. And, and to even acknowledge that you might need help is harder for the reasons we were saying before of like, you know, your coach or your family member might praise you for, oh my gosh, you're being so healthy for eating a salad. You know, Mm -hmm. it might be part of your identity. I'm the athlete who eats salad. Like, and it, it becomes a lot harder to even think that you need help. Mm -hmm. Um, so that realization that you might need help or that this might be unhealthy, that this might not be right, that this might not be optimal is difficult. And then one step further is yeah, finding somebody to understand that getting, yeah, financial assistance. It might be out of pocket more. Um, yeah, because I do like for me as a dietitian to, to bill insurance, I need that medical clinical diagnosis. Well, if we don't have you, you're, you're air quote healthy. Yeah. person. (laughs) Yeah. So hard. But, so I think it's, I'm yeah. glad we're just kind of acknowledging just sort of like some of the, the difficulties around this. Um, yeah. Okay. So someone comes to you and I do want to get into red S and all of the signs and symptoms, but yeah. I do want to start with just like when someone comes to you and they're, you know, saying like, okay, I, I think this is me, or it's just, I'm struggling with performance or recovery or whatever. Where do you even start? Because this is where I think it's tricky is in order to figure out if someone is eating like quote unquote enough, you also have to look at what they're eating, which includes some level of like measurement and counting calories, which is often counterintuitive to what we, what we got, like where we kind of want to go with it. So how do you navigate that? It's that just seems like such a tricky thing. Yeah. So yes, I, it really depends on each client. Um, on how much I, I truly am, like what they need, how much I'm going to truly look at their food or not. Um, but what I do with my clients is I do a picture-based system where they just take pictures of their Ooh. food so that they don't have to measure or weigh um, anything. They don't need to log every bite and ingredient. They literally just take a picture of it. And I'm confident enough in my own skills that I can I can look at a picture and, and really, I can do I'm a dietitian, right? Mm-hmm. I don't need you to calculate I, this is what I got a degree for. Let me do it. Trust in that. And, you know, I can through, uh, through my platforms and apps and website that I have, like I can communicate back to a client if it is a bowl of yogurt. And I'm like, okay, is that Greek yogurt? Is that flavored? Is it full fat? Is it non-fat? Like, you know, I can ask those questions to get more clarity um, on those things, but I don't want them. I want it to be easy for them. Take a picture, be done with it. Mm-hmm. Even with that being said, taking a picture of your food all the time, that in and of itself can still become overwhelming. You might think that, you know, somebody's judging you. You might be embarrassed. It might not, it might feel awkward when you're with family or friends. Um, So we don't do it all the time. I I will have a conversation with a client. Maybe we've had sessions for the last two weeks in a row. And then I'm like, you know what? Let's, let's take some food pictures for like three days, just so I can get an understanding of where you're at. And then I come back to them with helpful feedback on it so that they know like, okay, my three days of tracking my food was worth it. 
you know, I've got some good feedback. We work through it. And then I give them time to implement my feedback. So if it's, you know, yeah, you know, you're doing really great with breakfast now, but I've noticed like our afternoon snack, like sometimes it's hit or miss, like that, that's our goal that we work on. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, so that's what, you know, it, it is tricky. Um, I think when it comes to things like logging your food for a lot of people, uh, logging every bite of food that you eat or counting calories or macros can be a form of disordered eating. And so I don't want to promote that more. However, there's a big population where tracking calories or macros or tracking your food is also a really great learning tool to bring awareness to what you are eating. For sure. Um, and I think innocently, a lot of people start that way. They're like, you know what? I need to improve my diet. Let me download one of these apps. Let me track my diet. And it, it it's insightful in the beginning. Oh my gosh, I had no clue I wasn't getting enough protein. Mm-hmm. You know, if you have no clue how many calories you're eating, you have no knowledge about it. Tracking your diet might open your eyes. Oh, but now what you need is you need good, solid education and guidance. Okay, I'm eating X amount. I should really be eating Y amount. How do I get from X to Y? That's where things go wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or if the app itself has those stupid, you know, red, green light, like red, you're, you're over your limit of this app that doesn't know you doesn't know you're an athlete, doesn't know your needs, doesn't know that in addition to your workout, you had a job where you were physically on your feet all day and doesn't know that you're sleep deprived, whatever. It's like, it doesn't know you doesn't know your history. Doesn't know that you're struggling with lupus. Doesn't know that you have, um, celiac disease, whatever. Like it does not know your specific nutrition. It's just doing the most basic yep. calculation, height, weight, gender, age, the most basic rudimentary calculation and giving you a number. I I don't like when people go chasing that number or feel like, oh my gosh, I'm in the red. I did bad. When we start yep. going down that pathway with the apps, like now this can be absolutely become disordered, destructive, harmful. But if you're using it as a learning tool, like, and this, I would recommend to people, if you need to learn nutrition, you can use one of these apps, give yourself a, a deadline, like say, I'm going to do it for a week to learn and then step away from it and see if you can keep up the habits on your own. If, if you realize, well, I'm not getting enough protein. And then throughout the week, you use your tracker to find out like, okay, if I add Greek yogurt to my snacks on a regular basis, I'm reaching my protein goal. Oh, I need to make sure that I get, you know, uh, I'm, I need to have eggs for breakfast more often. The days that I had eggs for breakfast, as opposed to the muffins, like I did so much better. Okay, great. Now you've got some kind of behaviors and action steps. So step away from the tracking and just try and do those behaviors and action steps for a couple of weeks. And so it can be a using tool. And ultimately that's what I do for my clients too, except that I'm just doing it for them. So they don't Mm -hmm. even have to look at an app at all. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I feel like any, any woman who grew up in the early aughts can look at pretty much any food and probably tell you exactly how many calories are in it because we grew up in the time of like, I remember like having a book yeah. of like calorie counts on stuff. Yes, me too. What's it um, called? Like the fat secret or something <laughs> like, yeah, I have yeah. them too. So many of those, like I can like look at an egg and be like, I know that, that is 70 yeah. calories and six grams of protein. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like so, that and lives rent free in my head. It does. And so it's funny because with my clientele, I call, I I say you, you're all mini dietitians already. Like you're already halfway there. So I actually try and instill them to have trust in themselves. I'm like, if you already know it in your head, then why are we, why are we tracking it all? And, and the next thing though, is getting people to not track it in their heads as well, because, and I'll speak to myself. I am a dietitian. Quiz me on any food. I'm going to be like spot on with calories and macros. I got it. You've got like Google glass. that just like looks at the food and just like, you see the nutrition facts just pull up. Well, well, yes and no, because here's the thing. I know that information, but I do not access it all the time. So, so Mm -hmm. far today, uh, I've just eaten breakfast and coffee. I don't, at this moment in time, I have no clue how many calories or how much protein I've eaten. Give me another 35 seconds and I can figure it out for you. But I'm not actively thinking about that. Mm -hmm. And I think that is like the next step for people. It's like, okay, we want to stop using these um, apps, devices, or notebooks to write things down and track all the time. And then we need to get our mind to think differently about food. We don't want to think in numbers. 
We don't want to think in calories or macros. Um, so one of the methods that I teach my clients and we review is, is really thinking about what is food doing for your body. So as you're putting breakfast together, instead of having those Google glasses of the, the nutrition facts breakdown, it's, oh, I've got eggs for protein. I've got some cheese for calcium. I've got bread for good carbs to energize me. Let me throw in some blackberries for some antioxidants. And so we're thinking about what this food is doing for your body instead of just these arbitrary numbers. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's kind of, that's one way that our brain, we can train our brain to think differently about food. And then, you know, it can be like me, you know, now being like, yeah, I know that I got, I'm confident that I got a balanced breakfast. I, at this moment, I don't know how many grams of protein that I got this morning, but I know I've, I've checked my box for protein. And so I'm good. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Totally. Yeah. I love it. I love it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So I forget kind of how we got there, but, um, it's retraining your brain to think about food differently. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, Mm -hmm. okay. I think we should segue here and talk red S quickly because I know that's a big part of your practice. So give us just the quick, like, what is red S? How do we, what are our signs and symptoms? And I did have the question later, but let's do it now you know, we always think of like the female athlete triad and red ass and stuff as like things that happen to elite athletes, athletes who are actually, un, you know, like technically underweight. We don't think about it for like, you know, quote unquote, like normal people. Um, yeah. But let's, let's dispel that. <laughs> so sure. Talk yeah. me through. Reds, relative energy deficiency in sport. It's when you are not getting enough energy, you're energy deficient compared to the amount that you need for your sport or your exercise or your physical activity. So a lot of athletes come to me saying, I, I eat, I eat a lot of food. Is it enough relative to your needs? So you might be thinking, oh, okay, this, you know, somebody I'm not restricting, I'm, I'm eating 3000 calories. That's great. But if your sport requires, if your physical demands require 5,000, then you're still in a deficit. Mm-hmm. So this is where kind of that, um, you know, where we see what we see somebody doing might be different than what their body is still healthy for their body. What we see somebody looks like might still not be healthy for, for their um, body based on what their needs are. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, when you are in reds of having energy deficiency compared to your physical needs, um, a variety of, of symptoms can start happening. Um, you know, the first thing we can say is like, we can have uh, low energy, decreased performance, poor recovery, more injuries, um, lack of uh, clarity and focus, impaired judgment. So we actually have some cognitive declines. Um, and then it goes, you know, the longer this goes on, the deeper it gets. Okay, I'm not recovering well. And I'm actually having repeat injuries and my bones aren't healing well. Now I've got bone mineral density issues. Now I've got bone fractures going on because my bones are not um, developing enough. Now my hormones are all out of whack. Um, It can start with thyroid getting screwed up and then lead to estrogen, testosterone. Now I have amenorrhea. Now I'm, and that leads into the not recovering piece, not being strong. Um, endocrine dysfunction, you know, once hormones are screwed up, you know, it just keeps on going. It keeps on going with issues. Um, vitamin D iron is low. We've got nutrient, nutrient depletion, nutrient malabsorption. Um, so it, it kind of, Oh, GI issues is a big, big one here. Um, again, for a variety of reasons, but if you're not nourishing your gut enough, then your gut enzymes and probiotics um, aren't functioning well and you actually have increased gut issues, which is a dangerous cycle because the more gut issues you have, typically the more people think they need to restrict their diet or they're fearful of eating. You know, it's like, oh, I'm having all this um, bloating or diarrhea and thinking, okay, well, I should probably cut out dairy or I should cut out gluten or, you know, I just don't want to eat before a race because I don't want to have a problem, but it's truly the exact opposite. The reason you're having GI problems is because of malnourishment and reds and you need eating is your answer to healing your gut. Restricting more is not. Um, So GI issues is a big, big one. Um, I think too, when we say, sorry to cut you off, but when we say those hormonal imbalances, like it it just keeps going. Right. So like another thing that we see, um, with female athletes is like 
or, or actually with all athletes, but the female anatomy exacerbates this a little bit, but like urinary incontinence is something that can happen because our estrogen is low and our bladder lining is thin. And then we're also maybe not nourishing, right. Our body's not holding on to hydration as good. Our electrolytes are a little wonky. So just like urinary incontinence, feeling like you have to pee all the time is something that absolutely happens in reds. What? That is new information to me. Sleep Mind disturbances. Blown. Yes. Sleep disturbances are another one. And maybe it's because we're not nourished. It's because we're getting up to pee all the time. It's because we've got anxiety because we're not thinking clearly. And again, it's because our hormones are out of whack. So, um, you know, I, there's a lot of things like you can be reds can start to impact you maybe after just a month of being in reds, but then I'd say, okay, well, we can turn this around real quickly. If you've been in reds for three to six months, you're, you're probably feeling it but we can turn it around when you've been in reds for quite some time, you've got those deep hormonal imbalances. We can turn it around, but it's, it can also be tricky to uncover because you might be targeting like, Oh, doctor put me on thyroid medication because my thyroid screwed up and I'm working on pelvic floor exercises for my urinary incontinence. Like, great. These are all helpful things, but the root problem here is Mm -hmm. reds that we need to heal. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And actually what I was going to say is, so it is possible for someone to be in this for, for years without actually like getting help and just kind of assuming like, oh, my gut's just weird or like, yeah, I'm just feeling a little tired, but we're all feeling tired. We're endurance athletes. <laughs> right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, I think it's truly when somebody's healed that they feel that difference of like, just like, oh, I'm tired from my workout, but I'm not tired in everything in life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, yeah, and, uh, yeah. oh, I haven't had an injury in six months. That's amazing. Um, oh, I actually am improving, you know, my training. I, I'm not just like stagnant. I'm actually improving in my mm-hmm. training. Um, and yeah, ultimately too, reds can happen to anybody. I do work with many, um, high level athletes, elite athletes and Olympians that it has happened to, but frankly, to get to that level, although I, I want to debunk the idea that disordered eating and eating disorders doesn't exist in high level athletics because it does, but for the most part, you got to be well nourished and you got to be fueling well, you got to be strong to make it to that level and to stay at that level. Mm-hmm. So most of your professional athletes, the majority of them are going to be doing pretty darn well with their fueling and taking care of their bodies. And they hopefully also have a decent support system of dietitians and trainers, and maybe even some of them have chefs and stuff like that. Right. Um, it's actually the, the sub elite, Mm -hmm. the collegiate, the completely recreational athlete, or maybe even the athlete who doesn't identify as an athlete. Maybe they picked up sport as a hobby. Maybe they picked up sport to lose weight or to truly like in the most innocent of ways, like get healthier. Like, Oh, I want to start taking care of my health. They pick up, they start doing a couch to 5k. And then they're like, I love this. I'm going to sign up for a half marathon. I love that. I'm going to do a full marathon, but they're still stuck in like the mindset that they're not in calories a day yeah. mode. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's actually what I see. And I, I've had so many clients come to me who are literally like, Oh yeah. Like I did an iron man, but like, I'm not an athlete. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's because wild. Yeah. Their identity isn't there. And maybe they got into it, you know, for different reasons. And, and they, they're the ones that are thinking like, you know, that oh, I'm eating 2000 calories. That must be too much. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, no way. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, how many, I think we talked about this when I was on your podcast, like how many of us have gotten the advice in our life from someone where it's, Oh, women, 1800 calories a day is our max or like, Oh, you should go like 800 one day and then 1500 the next for some kicky fun. And you're like, yeah, wait a second. What? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's bad. And, and I'll, I also do want to say too, with, with breads, we know that it is an energy deficient state compared to your body's needs. And ultimately that means that you're, you're under fueling compared to your body's needs. And something I'm nervous about is that some, like, this is just a, um, my perception. I'm really glad about the conversation around reds. Cause I think it's taken away some stereotypes and it's opened up the conversation, but where I see it heading now is just as a replacement term for anorexia. And, mm. and it's not. 
because I've had so many clients come to me that say, I can't be in reds because I, I'm not underweight. And I'm like, that's not what this is. That was actually like, yeah, one of the questions I had here is, you know, where does this, where does like your weight come into this? Because as you're talking through all this stuff, the assumption, as you're saying, like all of these things are disrupted, the assumption is that like, oh, well, if all of those things are disrupted, naturally you would be skeletally skinny by the time that happens and, you know, be down to like 2% body fat. Um, But that's not true. It's not true because what happens is your body is trying to save and protect itself. And sometimes people in red start gaining weight (laughs) because their hormones are like, you're not giving me enough food. Every bite that you put in my body, I'm going to save and store because I know that tomorrow you're going to put me through this crazy three hour workout. And I don't like that. So I'm going to store everything just Mm -hmm. in case. And, um, so yeah, and that's something I'm I'm very nervous about people just using the term to just assume it's another um you know version of being underweight or a certain thin body type or something. This can happen to any body, to any weight, to any gender, to any sex, to any athlete in any sport. Um I've seen it happen in running. I've seen it happen in golf. I've seen it happen to special operations men. I've seen it happen to 12 year old teen, preteen girls. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's all across the spectrum. Um, and it it just comes to knowing what your body needs and and respecting what your body needs, regardless of body size, weight, shape, gender, race, all that. hundred percent. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it. Um, and I mean, the, the reality though, is like when you are starting to work with someone who is in this place, it can be really scary to suddenly be told to like eat more. Yeah. Um, so how do you, how do you like work someone through the idea that eating more may not like, I mean, it may, it may not make you gain weight. It may not like change your body comp. It yeah. may just make you a better athlete. It may improve your right. body comp. <laughs> right. And and it may, or it may not. So what I do is I, I just have to have a completely non-weight focused practice and lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't focus on weight for my clients. I don't focus on weight for myself. I don't, we just don't focus on weight. I don't care what your weight is. I Mm -hmm. don't. And I want to look at how you're feeling and your symptoms. Um, I have a client right now who, unfortunately her parents are stuck on the weight piece. I mean, I, I had to educate her parents with like actual studies and research as to why Continuing to focus on the weight is only harming her and perpetuating the problem. Um, Even if on paper, I can agree from a, like in this particular client, I can agree on paper, it would probably look better if she weighed a little bit more. At the end of the day, I don't care what her weight is as long as she's performing well, has a healthy relationship with food. And for this particular girl, gets her period back. She's got blood biomarkers and hormonal issues. So once those are healed, I don't know at what weight that's going to come back. at. I'm not going to set a weight goal. This could happen at a variety of different weights. So let's focus on, um, is she getting all her nutrition in? Is her period coming back? Is her blood biomarkers getting better? And does, how does she feel day in and day out? Mm-hmm. And then whatever weight her body falls at that point, huh, great. That's yep. theoretically a healthy weight for you now because your body is functioning well. That doesn't mean that's the weight that's going to be healthy for you the rest of your life. And that's the other reason I don't like to set weight goals at all because what's healthy, what's a healthy weight for you now might not be in two years. Yep. No. And, um, and so it's, it is, it is tricky. I don't want to, as a practitioner, I collect that information and it's one out of 100 different pieces of information that I'm evaluating. But mm-hmm. I feel like, unfortunately our society is like, people put that on a pedestal as if that's oh, yeah. the most important thing. And it's not, um, it is f- by far not the most important thing. It's, I would say one of the least important things. It's, it's not that I, I completely ignore it, but I, I do very little with it. Yeah. <laughs> I do very little with it. Yeah. So I don't, I don't talk about it with my clients. They bring up weight and I'm like, I don't care. Yeah. What's definitely hard about it is, uh, in cycling, you know, all of these online platforms now, they're all like power to weight based as far as, you know, yeah. how you're training on them, which it like, I mean, we don't own a scale. Like I, I refuse to like engage with a scale because I, I know myself, but it's very upsetting to me that 
there are now millions of people that literally have to weigh in in order to race on these platforms or even ride on them yeah and put the number in like were I to do it I literally would have to have like Peter look at the scale for me and type it in because I just don't want to see it because I know that me with any number is never going to be a good thing like yeah yeah, it, it is unfortunate. And again, that's why I think when I'm as a practitioner, when I'm working with a client, I'm like, okay, let me deal with that. Like even, you know, when it comes to nutrition, we do have weight-based calculations. Like if you're an endurance athlete versus a strength athlete, how many grams per kilogram of your body weight of carbohydrate mm-hmm. do you need for your workout? So, but like, I'm like the difference of five pounds is, is nothing to me. Like you just, es- would yeah. you just estimate your weight? Say, like I'm good enough, close enough. I can ballpark um, the kilograms I need. Like, yeah, let's <laughs> ballpark it. Because at the end of the day, your diet's going to be ballparking it too. Like I, well, like we started this conversation, I don't need us to weigh and measure every exact thing. Like, did you have 130 grams of carbs today or did you have 140? Basically the same thing, by the way, it's not enough. So <laughs> let's get that way up there <laughs> because like either way, we're in the ballpark of that's far too few carbohydrates. Yep, yep. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I love it. I love it. Okay. The other thing I did want to come back to that you just mentioned here casually is, uh, you know, the, the getting your period back as like one of the, you know, markers of hormonal health. So I'm going to throw a monkey wrench in this. How do you work with clients who are on hormonal birth control? Because this is a huge percentage of women. Like this is, you know, I've talked about it on this podcast. I have an IUD. I don't get a period. I have no idea. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Well, there's plenty of other symptoms um, that we can track and look at. So if your your period is only what your period being there or missing or your hormonal profile is only one of many different symptoms of reds and only one of many different markers of health. So, um, you know, and, and I'll work with people too, like with an IUD, um, you should theoretically still be ovulating. And there are ways that we can figure out if you're ovulating mm-hmm. by uh, yeah, we can track that. We can get ovulation test strips. We can track, um, discharge. So there's other ways to identify that. Um, but if somebody's happy on a hormonal birth control, like continue to that. But if somebody's like, I don't even like that I'm on this, then, um, then we might trial getting off of it and getting more in tune with their natural body and cycle. Mm -hmm. Um, if there is one, if there isn't one, then we're going to work towards that. Um, so I've worked with both, but if somebody's happy, like this is working for me, this is my form of birth control, or, you know, this is like in my pet, like I had cysts and this really regulates me, like, then we're going to stay on that. And we're going to look at your performance, your injuries. Are you actually meeting your energy needs? Um, how is your skin doing? How's that urinary incontinence doing? Whatever. We're going to look at everything else. Mm -hmm. Um, and then yeah. there are some clients that choose in this process that they do want to get in touch with their natural cycle mm-hmm. and, and yeah. explore that and we get off of it. Yeah. No, I just, I love that we've talked about so many of the different signs and symptoms because I think we really do get fixated on like, yeah, am I getting my period? Am I this weight? Am I, you know, it's, it's yeah. just like very like black or like black and white, yes or no thing. And it's so much more nuanced than that. So I'm, I'm so it glad is. And, and going back to, you mentioned the female athlete triad earlier. Um, And I do support the research behind female athlete triad. I, you know, I've got nothing wrong with the science there, but one of the issues with the female athlete triad is it is just pointing out three things, Mm -hmm. your hormonal function, focusing on, do you have a period or not? Um, And then your bone mineral density. um, And then are you eating enough? And, And those are three things when red S is encapsulating a lot more than that. And, um, because a lot of people will rule out, well, I have my period and my bone density is fine. So I must be fine. Well, no, you could still have reds. And, and also to share a little bit of my personal story, that, that was me. Um, I personally, for gosh, many, many years, I was on uh, the birth control pill and never had bone density issues. And so I would have never classified myself as having female athlete triad, mm-hmm. nor was I in a category of anorexia, nor did I think I did not think I was under fueling. It did not look like I was under fueling. Everybody thought I ate great, but I can tell you now in hindsight, there was a period of my time that of my life that I was under fueling compared to my sport needs. My bone density was great because of how I grew up. My bone density was good. Maybe genetics. I was a gymnast, whatever. Um, and my hormones were, I don't know what they were because I was on birth control. Yeah. 
but I had other issues. I had GI issues. I had skin issues. I had a disordered relationship mindset around food for a little bit of time in my early twenties. Um, I had fatigue. I had poor muscle recovery. I had low iron multiple time periods in my early twenties. And when I think back now, I'm like, I, I was strictly calorie counting throughout college and that it wasn't enough. I shared with you, I was, you know, exercising four hours a day for a D1 program. I can look back now and say, I was not eating enough, but yep. I didn't know. I didn't know hmm. I wasn't. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's amazing when you think about like Ironman training or, you know, ultra, any ultra endurance, like the volume that you're training, it's actually hard to eat enough sometimes to like maintain yeah. that. And yeah, for a lot of people. Um, yeah. Especially yeah. with traditional, uh, what people think is healthy. Like if you're trying to eat broccoli and quinoa all the time, it's gonna be really hard, but for if sure. you're comfortable, you know, having a baked potato as a snack and you're comfortable grabbing bagels more often and you're comfortable drinking orange juice, then it's going to be a lot easier. But so yep. many people like, again, those traditional messages are like, don't drink your calories and like eat whole grains and eat more vegetables, which is generally decent advice. But when you're Ironman training or something like that, as you said, eating that way, is going to be very difficult to meet your performance nutrition goals. Mm -hmm. Yep. I was so happy. I did a 20 mile run this weekend with a couple of friends. And then we went out to breakfast afterwards and uh, in Ontario, or I don't know if it's Ontario or where, whatever the case, this restaurant had all of the calorie counts next to the meals. Yeah. And I was so jazzed that all of us were actually looking not for what was going to be like the least, but, the but we were all like, what has the most calories? Like what is the most yeah. calories per yeah. dollar? Yeah. I love that. It yeah. was great. <laughs> like, I'm so you glad we're up. all yeah. aligned on this. I love that too. It was fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> now, okay. Before we're like getting close to time here, but I do want no. to ask this question. I know we might have to do a second one because this is such great information. And I do want to, I do want to touch on this because I know there are a lot of people listening to this that do cut, you know, they've come into endurance sport because they were, they wanted to lose weight. Like that is a normal reason for people yeah. to get into running, get into cycling, yeah. get into triathlon. So like, I, I never want to alienate those people and make it seem like we're, you know, talking to just people who like have no issues with this. People yeah. do get into this because of weight loss. So yeah. if you are someone who wants to lose weight through sport, like a, you know, is it possible to engage in healthy weight loss while training? And then B, like, what are the like no-nos around this um, and yeah. things to keep in mind while you're on this journey. Sure. So yeah, I'm, I'm not anti-weight loss, nor am I anti-weight gain, just to throw it out there. Mm -hmm. I want people to fuel and nourish their bodies to be healthy and feel good and be strong and do what they want in their life. And if, if they are healthier and feel better and they're more energized with weight loss, um, there is a healthy way to do that. I would still strongly encourage you to find a purpose for your sport beyond just weight loss. hundred percent. So, you know, make sure that, because look, if you're, if you're forcing yourself to run, to lose weight and you hate running, like go do a Zumba class instead. Like there's other ways to get moving and be physically active. Um, and that ultimately is, is the goal. So make sure that you are getting benefits out of the sport that you are engaging in, um, whether it be alone time or like getting outside, or maybe it's a social activity or the fact that you get to listen to music or podcasts, like whatever form of movement you are choosing, make sure that you have it and more, more reasons for doing it than just for weight loss, because it, that won't be enough. It, it just won't be enough. You will resent it and it won't last. hundred percent. Um, and then from there, I think if you have that mindset shift, you can start to to think, well, how do I take care of my body to do this? So, okay, I'd, I'd love to lose weight, but I have noticed that if I go out for a run without eating breakfast, like the run's pretty crappy. Okay, then take care of yourself, take care of your body. How can you take care of your body? I'm gonna eat breakfast. What's a breakfast that's gonna make me feel good on my run? Is it gonna be the soda and Cheetos? No, that's not gonna make you feel good on your run. <laughs> um, but maybe um, a, a bagel with a slice of cheese and an egg. And uh, some berries does make you feel good when you go out for a run. Great. So now we've just taken care of our nutrition and we've had a great run and we're feeling good about both things. And that's ultimately too, like 
you want to lose weight, it, it comes down to, I think, respecting your body's needs. And so does that mean extreme restriction? No. Does that mean fasting? No. Those that does that mean keto diet? I'm sorry, but no, that's not respecting your body's needs. Your body does need a variety of nutrients, carbohydrates, proteins, fats, vitamins, minerals. Um, it does function best when you eat in different increments throughout the day. I mean, for some people that's just eating three times a day for sometimes some people it's eating six times, but we do know through research that longer fasts and like only eating one meal a day is not ideal for blood sugar regulation, insulin response. So it's like, okay, like put yourself on some sort of, I'm not saying strict regimen, but like eat three meals a day. And now within that meal, did I get a variety of nutrients? Um, did my, was it just a plate full of just carbs or did I make an effort to put some spinach on that plate and put some protein on that plate? Like we have to put in that effort. I, 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 I know some people are not educated on nutrition because our society hasn't educated people on nutrition, but if I'm being a hundred percent honest, um, it's not that hard. I've got a degree and I've got a master's degree in it. And I'm telling you, it's not that hard. <laughs> um, we have to ignore all of, all of those crappy articles and BS saying, eat this, not that. And just think I should have some protein, some vegetables and some carbohydrate on my plate. Yep. And if you do that consistently, you will see results. And now if you've been doing that consistently, maybe it does come down to portions um, and maybe we do need to get some education on what portion is best for you. Um, or there's another route to do this instead of just learning like, oh, like I should have one cup, not two cups, but truly listening to your body. Okay. Well, when I ate two cups, I'm, I'm, I'm stuffed and, and I've gotten used to being stuffed. Is it okay if I'm just full instead of stuffed? Let me try uh, a few meals, like just being full instead of stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to be starved. So many people go from like, stuffing themselves to them being starving. And it's like, we just need to take like step back a scale, like just like a little notch. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want you to be starving and uncomfortable. However, it might take a little bit of relearning, like what your body needs with like your natural hunger and fullness cues. I love teaching people about their hunger and fullness cues, Molly, because so many people don't have no clue. Like, oh yeah. We know when we're starving, we know when we're stuffed and we have no clue that middle Nothing ground in between. In between. We have to learn that. And it's crazy because we, we all knew it as children. We knew, um, like, yeah, we just, and I, like I said earlier in the podcast, I have two young kids and one of them, um, is two years old. And so like, yeah, like he, sometimes at dinner, he doesn't want to eat. He takes a few bites and he's done. And I know I'm like, this is your favorite meal, you know, but he's just like, no, I'm good. Like he just stops. Um, and then other times he's like gobbling it all up. And I'm like, you're, you're a machine. You're crazy. Like as children, <laughs> they're really in tune. And throughout life as adults, we get confused with the, the eat this, not that mentality, the fear of fat, the fear of overeating the sometimes even people, um, food insecurity can be an issue. Like, I don't know when my next meal is going to be, so I'm going to eat all of this right now. Mm -hmm. Um, that can be a problem. And you just can see that during like an, an office day, right? Like I only have 15 oh, minutes to like cram in lunch. Yeah. I'm going to shove it down. Yep. Like, mm -hmm. And yeah, you're just like shoveling it and then you're back to work and it just doesn't even, doesn't even register. Right. Yeah. So I think so much with like get, getting back to your question of like, can we lose weight in a healthy way? I think being um, in tune with your body's needs. And this is one piece of intuitive eating. It's just one piece of it. Um, that's a phrase that people throw around a lot. Intuitive eating, it's a process, but learning your hunger and fullness cues is one piece of it. And it really helps you respect your body's needs more. So again, how do we lose weight while engaging in physical activity in a healthy way? I want you to, is to think about just respecting your body's needs. And you might need to learn that or relearn that, what that really means, but it's, it's choosing foods that make you feel good that don't make you starving, that don't make you stuffed. And you, and you really have to pay attention to that, Molly. Mm -hmm. So this is the thing, people don't pay attention because we eat in front of the TV. We eat in the car. We eat on the go. We eat standing up. And it can be hard to, to carve out that time and say, I'm going to, I'm going to make a meal. I'm going to sit. I'm going to be intentional about my meal. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to eat it with as few distractions as possible. And so many people say, I don't have time to eat. I'm like, you know what? How long does it really take to eat a sandwich? Six minutes. You don't have six minutes. Yeah. It doesn't, it really doesn't take that long, but if you could just sit down for six minutes and, and 
beyond just your health, your physical health or nutritional health. I think your mental health would be oh so my improved. Gosh, yes. If you could just sit down for six minutes, like a meal does not need to be this hour long process though. If you have the luxury to do that, it is splendid. Um, but like, give yourself that opportunity to listen to your body and respect your body and you will learn what it needs. And this might sound really, really vague to some people, but it it is the key. No, I think that's such a good starting point for sure. I love that. Okay. Before we let you go, tell everyone where they can find you, your courses, your offerings, your podcast, all of the things. Sure. So I am in a little bit of a a transition mode with business. Um, I first want to say that the thing that's going strong right now is my podcast female athlete nutrition podcast. That is my specialty right now is female athletes and nutrition, obviously. Um, so good. Everyone should listen to that too. Follow along immediately. Yes. Yes. Um, my bit, I've got two young kids and one of them has some medical needs. So I've had to slow down business. I'm working with only a select handful of one-on-one clients at the moment. Um, but if you just want to follow my business, even as it's morphing, um, head to my website, which is currently rise up nutrition run.com riseupnutritionrun.com. Uh, you can get on my mailing list. That would be helpful to stay in touch. You can follow me on Instagram at female athlete nutrition, female dot athlete dot nutrition. Sorry about that. Gotta and all the dots. You know, yeah, I gotta love the dots. Um, kind of keep people updated there too. So I'm I and and you can also just email me um lindsay.riseupnutrition at at gmail.com. Ultimately, I really want people to continue to to follow me. Business is, is morphing a little bit, but this is my passion, something I'm really good at. Um, so this moment in time, we're recording in March 2024. Things are a little bit slow, but I, I'm keeping the podcast going because I love, I like podcasting. Okay. I like talking about it. And it's just such a good way to get content out there um, that I think is meaningful, like meaningful conversations instead of just like a a little Instagram post that nothing's wrong with that, but sometimes we don't like, we don't get to talk through it, you know? Could not Um, agree more, especially, I mean, honestly, especially with nutrition where so much can get lost in a 60 second. In a post. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Exactly. So, you know, what I'm doing right now, I'm keeping up the podcast. Um, If you are interested in one-on-one work, please, you know, shoot me an email and we'll see if it works out with, you know, us and my lifestyle right now. Um, I am doing team-based or presentation-based things. Um, so I have a couple contracts with some teams and universities, you know, I present to a, a collegiate, um, track and field and cross country team, like twice a semester. So we can arrange team-based things. I do have an online course, um, all about female athlete nutrition and it's, it was intended to be 12 weeks or it's 12 modules and each module dives into like really helpful fundamentals of, uh, fueling as a female athlete, like, you know, a module about carbohydrates, a module about your menstrual cycle, a module about intuitive eating, a module about pre and post-workout nutrition module about hydration. So it's all specific to female athletes. And so you can, um, sign up for that whenever it's it's all online and it's information for you to keep forever. And there's like, um, recipes in there. There's little homework challenges for you to do like on your own to help you implement. It's not just like, here's information It's here's information. Here's how to implement it into your life. Love it. Love um, it. That sounds like a great place for people to start for sure. Yeah. So the online course, tune into the podcast and, and stay tuned. Perfect. Ah, oh, Lindsay, thank you so much for taking the time. This has been same as when we first talked on your podcast. So much fun. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Thank you, Molly. Um, Thank you for all you do. And it was really fun to chat with you. Thanks so much for tuning in to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. If you want to hear more training, racing, and endurance sport advice, make sure you subscribe to the podcast and leave us a rating and review. You can also subscribe to our newsletter at consummateathlete.com for a weekly dose of inspiration and advice straight to your inbox. 